How far back? I mean. To when you went into service. Just from then. Yes. Okay. We're rolling. All right. This is a home interview, Victor, New York. It is the 23rd of August, 2005, approximately 4.30 p.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? It's Thurl B. Amos Collier, born on the 31st of October, 1918, uh, in Shade Gap, Pennsylvania. And I went to work at, um, got a job at the Illumina. Well, I cut paper wood or cut down trees when I was 17. I stacked lumber. Uh, when I was 18, and I went out to Cleveland, Ohio, and got a job in the aluminum factory out there making Allison heads for fighter planes. And I got my induction papers for the 19th of August, and uh, I took my greetings from the government in there, and they said, another man to be deferred, and I said, not me, I'm going to get my year over with. And uh, This was in 1941. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, then I went to, um, up, up, went back to Pennsylvania and worked in the sawmills, stacking lumber and cutting down trees. And then I went up to, um, to Bath, to Russia, New York, to my brother's house, stayed all night, <clears throat> and went to Churchville, and they signed me up with the Army there. I went to Niagara Falls, and we did some training and learned to march, and, and then we picked peaches. The column of tools would line up out on the, in front of the barracks there, and uh, the farmer would come along to pick up truck one, four, five, and they'd just count them off. And, uh, pick, or, um, vans would come along and pick up so many. And when the pieces was done, we went to picking prunes. And then when that was done, we went to picking apples. And then we went to, uh, got on our train and went to Camp Wheeler, Georgia. <clears throat> and uh, I was hitchhiking from Georgia to um, Dublin, from Macon, Georgia to Dublin. And uh, Mr. Dixon picked me up and it came over the air that Pearl Harbor. So the must, I was on my way back on the Sunday morning, and they said that uh, the Japs had attacked Pearl Harbor. And he told me that his son, had, they just got a letter from his son, and a couple of weeks before, he had landed in the uh, Philippines. And we took our basic training down there and set up machine guns around the place to, Case the Japs was coming over. Then we went to Fort Ord and drilled and uh, marched. And then we went to Hawaii over to Honolulu. Oh, did you go on any of the maneuvers in the South? No. 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 Uh, we did a lot of marching, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, the maneuvers were all done by that time. Mm -hmm. And we. Then we went to, over to um, Hawaii to guard the islands over there. The first, the, we were the first outfit out, the 27th. Mm -hmm. uh, and we went over and we was on the beaches and uh, I, uh, they brought a shipload of lumber over there. And I was the only hillbilly there that uh, knew how to stack lumber. so. 
um, I took over the stack of the lumber, and uh, they made a corporal out of me. And uh, then they cut down, we cut down trees 10 feet long and 8, 10 inches in diameter, and we set them like posts all over the parking areas and parks and to keep so the Japs couldn't land. And, uh, and someone had put the um, pillboxes in the, by the runway, and they put them in too high. And there was no bottom in there, it was just a steel thing with the, it looked like a box with no top on it turned upside down. And um, me and Godfrey had, uh, they sent a platoon out to, uh, lower them down eight inches and there was only two that wasn't city guys so they put us to uh, the two of us got in the down in and dug out underneath that and, and then the guys would push it down and uh, when it was all done that uh, there was only two of us worked the other rest of them played cards and, uh, but me and Godfrey both liked to work so uh, the lieutenant said he would um, couldn't get. He'd like to give us a three-day pass, but he uh, couldn't, so he gave us three 24-hour passes. And, and then when we cut down the, the trees, um, I found early on. If you wanted to go to Honolulu or you wanted to go and pass, you went alone and you kept your shoes shined and your uh, clothes all trim, uh, neat, and and no whiskers, and the MPs never bothered you. <laughs> to get out of there, I would. Uh, you had to have your dog tags on. I never. I've never had nothing on my body but a belt. <laughs> and uh, I would take my dog tags and stick them in there, and put, a, put the thing in and let them stick out, and that would get me by the inspection. And then when I got burned down close to the guards, I would um, hitchhike with it. Command car mostly. I'd like to get a command car, but I couldn't get a jeep, and uh, they'd pass me right on through. And coming back, then I would do, get anybody if was, anybody could ride that would pick me up. And if nobody would pick me up, I would uh, watch for a truck that was coming back from recreation to. For the guys, and uh, I'd take my necktie off and set them down, and they'd take me back into camp. Uh, but when we cut down the trees, when that was done, they called me in and made a um, sergeant out of me. And We was out in the jungle cutting down trees, and the sergeant would say, "Hey, Carl, you do this or do that," and then they made me sergeant. So then the next day I went out. And he said, "Come and do this, Carl." I said, "You do it, Sarge. I'm a sarge too." He said, "I don't know how. I don't know how the hell you're going to take give orders. You never could take them." <laughs> I thought I was good at it. <laughs> So they put me, uh, I had a 75 down on the beach, and three guys went to sleep. Uh, there was, I had six men on the bridge to blow the bridge to keep the Japs from going anywhere they wanted to. And six guys on the 75 down on the beach. And they put on a triple alert. And they, then you had to have three on guard at duty at one time. And uh, 
so the guys came to me and they said, we, we don't get any sleep. We have to get up every two hours, go on duty. He said, how about us standing guard? Uh, three of us will go on from uh, seven to one, and then three will come on at one till seven, six hours each. Uh, And then we tra uh, switched them. The ones that was on first would go on last, and that put um, eleven hours in one in one day, and one in the next day. Uh, and then I spent I should, I used uh, took the time down on the beach in the daytime and let them sleep, uh, but they caught them and court-martialed them, and I was of course. The sergeant, so I was the number one witness, and I didn't lie to him. I just didn't tell him the whole story. I let it go like I would, they were doing 14 hours a day guard duty. So they busted me down to a private and turned him out of the guardhouse. Uh, we was in Black Sand Beach, and I was on town patrol a lot there. Um, and they was on a big gun overlooking the Hilo Harbor there, and uh, with a real fancy cabin up on top of the cliff there, and a big screened-in porch, and that's where we slept. We didn't get in the rest of the place, but we slept in the screened-in place there, and they brought us our meals three times a day. And uh, it was all bluff, because we never had a shell for the gun. But we was there every morning and every evening so people would see us. That was good duty. And uh, it was a five-inch gun taken off of the Arizona. Now, was there still a lot of evidence when you got there of the attack on Pearl Harbor? Could you see a lot of the oh, a lot of destruction and the broken glass ship? and windows, or um, uh, windows broke out and shell holes and buildings mm -hmm. where the machine guns and now how long were you um, at Hawaii must have been close to two years year and a half to mm -hmm. two years um, now when were you finally assigned to a a tanker unit, uh, the self-propelled gun. I was uh, trained on 81 mortars mm -hmm. and uh, the machine guns. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there were three of us sergeants that trained the um, Hawaiian department there, the National Guard there, uh, in uh, Eva, Hawaii there. Uh, and then Cannon Company came over. Oh, uh, I told I, I said that the Captain Catlin was to blame for the guys having too much guard duty, and he said I was that I'd given too much guard duty, and we are. I'm a little bit on the stubborn side, so we argued a bit, and um, he got tired of it. And Cannon Company came over. He put me in Cannon Company. Uh, put two of us in, and the one guy baldly took, uh, took him back to, to where he was at before. And uh, that saved my life because D Company, I, I think Perner all killed on the 7th of, of July over there. And, Uh, I like to walk and I like to see things. So I got a 10 hour pass and walked over to the mountain in Hawaii and I walked over the, up the mountain and had nothing to drink. And um, they, up on top of the mountain they had a little cabin up there and a um, 
I had no, I was really thirsty. And they had a barrel there to catch in the rainwater on the roof there. Uh, but uh, it was full of little wigglies. And I brushed them aside a little bit, had me a little belly full of wiggly water. Uh, and it had rolls of bob wire in there, 10 or 12 rolls of bob wire in there. Uh, I don't know what that was for. And we marched up over there one night, and about uh, 12 o'clock, we uh, had us go to sleep any place. And uh, I went in, uh, went and got those big banana leaves, and I made a bed on top of these rolls of wire. And I slept on top of the wire on the, on the leaves, and the other guys, they slept out in among the mosquitoes. Uh, and when we was in Kukui, it um, rained 20 days out of 21, and uh, I took off and went to um, Hilo. And uh, the lieutenant wanted to know where I was at, and asked where I was at, and they said, I'd went to the dentist. Well, the dentist wasn't open that day. So when I come home, he was a little on the teed off, and he said, now, um, you guys uh, sharpen up a little, he said, because we're going to need another corporal one of these times. I was a sergeant at that time. I was a corporal at that time. And uh, we moved to Hilo. And um, we was on guard duty, and we had they took uh, everybody off of guard duty and put them on a truck, and took them to Hilo, and uh, I had to walk, but that's all they did about it. Uh, and the um, I was so tired towards the end of the thing. It was about twenty mile hike down there after walking all day on guard duty, uh, and uh, it's a column of twos, so they kept me in the middle, they kept, they kept me walking in the middle so they wouldn't blunder off into the ditch. <laughs> Got down into Hilo, and I had a good friend in E Company, Anahar, and we was in the mess hall, and I had my head down and somebody tapped me from the other side of the table and I looked up and I said, where's Anahar? And I was talking to Anahar. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was one of the ones killed. I wonder how you could find out. I'm sure there's probably a listing somewhere of the ones that were killed. I couldn't find nothing over in Okinawa or Saipan. I see you have a computer. Are you hooked up to the internet? No. No, no I didn't even want that. Yeah, I was going to say, if, if you have a son or daughter-in-law that has a computer, they do a search of the 27th, possibly they could find something on the internet. Well, um, I just came from my daughter-in-law there and she's good on it. Mm -hmm. And my daughter in Baltimore is really good on it. Uh, did she get in touch with you? No. Well, no. I don't think so. Is she married? What, what, what's her maiden name? Or her married name? Uh, Parsons. Uh, Carol Parsons. I, I don't recall that name. No. Is she the one that sent asked for the form? Yeah. Then yes, I did get a letter, something from her. Yes, yes. Okay. She sent. She asked me to send the form to you. Yes, that's right. Okay. I remember that. Now. Yeah, she's in Savannah Park. Okay. Did you um, train on uh, the self-propelled gun uh, on Hawaii at all? Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, I was a couple years older than 
anybody else in the outfit except the officers. And I don't know how old they were, but. So you were what, about 23, 24? Well, let's see when he was. 1918, four. so. I think 21. 21. Because I was gone 46 months. Mm -hmm. Never saw anybody I knew for 46 months. Mm -hmm. Never had a furlough. Now, um, did you do any train practice uh, on landings and so on while you were at Hawaii? Beach landings and... Yeah, yeah, we went over and landed on Maui. Mm -hmm. uh, we went a couple of places. And one day we went and in the tank, in the Higgins boat, and uh, every once in a while a wave would come along and over the top. And they had, uh, what was, the, was it the Mae West they had that you put around and you mm -hmm. tightened up a little cylinder? And uh, when that water was coming over the top, I <laughs> kept that screwed up pretty near tight and ready to give her a little more if that too much come over the top. Because it was times that the waves were so rough that uh, you couldn't see the boats next to you. They'd be down in when, mm -hmm. when you were down in it. Was that Barber's Point? Uh, for quite a while, and two guys went to sleep, on, or didn't go to sleep, they run off to Honolulu. And I was up in the mountain, that was the day I took the big walk up in the mountain, and Lieutenant O'Toole uh, was a real army man, and uh, I was the only hillbilly, for near everybody was, uh, we had three or four or five um, rebels in there from down in south there, but uh, uh, I was the only one from, from Pennsylvania. No, at the time I was the only one from Pennsylvania, and I was in a New York outfit, a and uh, that's how I got to be a corporal's part of it, because he was pushing me a little. Uh, But when the guys went to sleep, they made, um, they picked out three sergeants to go and bring them back walking. And we're supposed to each have seven miles. And I got back there, and here the guy had um, played off sick and went to the doctor. So uh, then that, when I got back, they picked me. And uh, I said, um, he said, make sure they don't get away from you. And I said, what What can I do if they run? And he said, if you're afraid to go, I'll send somebody else. I said, no, I'm not afraid to go, but I'd like to know the rules before I do go. And, oh, they threatened to break my legs and little things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, and the cars on the, would stop on Sunday. The car would stop and pick us up, and I said, no, we're walking for our health, and kept on walking. But we got back home, back to camp, and they um, put the two of them digging a big hole. And uh, one of them dug a little bit and said, hell, but he wasn't digging anymore, and he didn't. The other guy kept digging, but I think they both got the same out of it. Went one day without permission to Honolulu. When I got back, the outfit had moved out, moved another 20 miles. And 
but the guys had thrown everything I had on the truck and took it with them. And here's all strangers. I went into a place of all strangers, and and uh, the a lieutenant said, "Hey, have the two guys do this." They were just moving in, and I said, "You and you get over and do this." And then I out around the tent and kept right on going. Never took back. <laughs> now, what did you did you live in tents while you were in Hawaii? Uh, the, we first went there. We lived in a schoolhouse, and you had this solid. It was one big room, and it was solid beds, uh, with a path about that wide, uh -huh. here and there, and you would have your barracks bag under one under your bed and you had to stand on the other bed and pick it up and get your stuff out of there. And we eat K rations, sea rations left over from World War One. And you got a can of meat and beans, everybody could eat them. But the hash was a little on the sad side and the um, stew, I think it was stew. And one can of dog biscuits. Uh, you got to the four cans in the morning, and you were done for the day. Next morning, you could do the same thing again. We moved to Hilo, and then we moved back to um, up to Schofield Barracks, and um, we took a hike one night and over the poly, and our radio was, was lost, and I heard him tell the guy, the other radio man, uh, the mountain is at my back, and uh, I'm under the Big Dipper. <laughs> I thought it was pretty well all under the Big Dipper, but... We took a walk uh, one day and walked clear up over the mountain where I went, except uh, the whole army went that time. And we had got about 12 o'clock, and they said, fall out and go to sleep. And we was in a guava patch of the field. There was a little short uh, thorns. And when we come down off of that, next morning there was a truck sitting there with those 30 gallons um, pots that they used in there and uh, we had French toast and I tell you down towards the end of them there were little thin ones when that's <laughs> with 30 gallons of them on the top But after you uh, left Hawaii, where did you go? Right straight to Saipan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I thought it, um, we was on a big ship when we went in there, and uh, there was Japs, a lot of dead Japs swimming there. So we must have been out quite a little ways because they said the uh, reef was high. Uh, and. <coughs> There was dead ones and, and some that was riding on something and they'd crawl off and just uh, have their nose above water. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just laughed at them one on through. <clears throat> and um, it was right at, um, down over the hill from uh, Esalito Airport there. And the uh, first night I heard an airplane coming and I had um, was standing the 50 caliber straight up, and I'm standing up on the cannon, holding on the 50 caliber, and this airplane came across, and turned right above me and took off down the beach, strafing. So I had a good chance to shoot the zero down, and um, left us anyway. The next morning we got up and walked out around the hill and up into Esalute Airfield. And the, 
there was dead Japs all over the place. And one, um, we watched a fight, dog fight up there at, uh, with about eight or ten of each. And um, one of them, you'd see him smoking and heading for the ocean, but uh, one guy came down and he's going to land right in front of us. Just outside of the airport, I just had to get over a fence row there in, in the Escalito Airport, and uh, somebody took a shot at him, and he just got up enough to clear there. The smoking thing, down in the airport, jumped out, Marines all around him, and he said, "I thought there was Imperial forces owned this." He said, "Or I'd have landed at sea." So we went on through the airport there, and there wasn't many names of things. Now, Napatan there, uh, that was quite a big chunk of land, and there was a, it was just a little past the SLE airport and a little bit to the east of it, I guess. and. Um, Old Holland Mad, they went through there, but they left an awful lot of them. He was in such a hurry. When they came, to, the Marines had to hurry because he, um, Holland Mad, stepped out there on the ship and had a map. And he looked at the map and he decided how far the men was to go that day. And they give the Marines the flat country where they could use tanks and anything they wanted, give the 27th Division those hills where they're coming up and down. The Marines could have uh, walked back fa backwards faster than uh, they could have gone went through the hills there, woods and cl cliffs and steep ones. How did you feel about Howling Mad Smith? I'd like to have him shot. I went down to the down to the. Uh, he passed up any time there was a big fight. The men didn't have time to fight. He was. I think he was setting out on the ship, but uh, they didn't have time to clean him out uh, because suicide gulch there. They were. They couldn't go in there with tanks. Um, the 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 day before the big bonsai attack there, they were fighting there that day, and I imagine Helen Mad Smith saying, "Move faster, move faster." So you're saying he left pockets of of Japanese as they moved yeah. through. Yeah, I got hit every time, three times, um, after the island was secure. Well, they told us that um, the Marines would uh, fight their way across an island and then fight their way back to the ship and leave. And that's about what they did. It says in the paper there that uh, they were killed 1900 after the island was secured. Because we went up uh, a Napatan. I don't know for sure where it was, except it was right close to the airport there. And the, we, the four M8s on the 105th there, the self-propelled guns there, uh, we was put about 40 feet apart across the where the big boulders and the trees were. We tried to get through them one day, and uh, I had a couple of guys go with us for a little ways, but when we got a little ways, because there wasn't room to get the, the M8 through there. And so we backed up and, and went around the other way, but uh, the, uh, they said that they thought there was about 500 there. Smith thought there was about 500 there, and old Holland Mad said there was only uh, wasn't over 200. When they gathered up the dead after they went over the island one time to 
we found 1,250 bodies there. Uh, the, the newspaper, they were all in the Holland Mad Smith's side. And that one newsman said that the 27th Division was held up by a few Japs in a cave. A few Japs in a cave could have been 150 Japs because uh, one, no, that was on Saipa, or um, Okinawa. But um, we went up, there was about 200 of us going through uh, And the other S are up pretty near the middle of the island or someplace. And there was a couple hundred of us going through a field. And we went down over a hill into a little valley. And there was a mound of dirt down there and a hole like a woodchuck hole in each side of it. And they throw the satchel charge in there, the, one of our soldiers. And a Jap run out the other side and down the gully and there was about 50 men up on the hill shooting at him. And they throwed another one in another Jap run out through there. And then the, the head of a Jap that about every two seconds there was a Jap would run across the foot of the cliff there. Uh, and had the uh, guys were shooting at him, and he when he got to the other side, another one would run, or if he didn't make it, uh, they'd, another one would take off. And here I have the spot, um, the whole wall was brown with Japanese. They were climbing out of there, getting out of there, because they could see all these soldiers coming through the field. And uh, so I dropped one of those 15 pound projectiles right in the middle of them in the stone wall there in the, I don't know, 40, 50 or come rolling down off of there. And then the Japs, the Americans had something to shoot at. And then we moved on and we went about 50 yards past the end of the, gu of the gully there and the lieutenant uh, says he thinks that there was a Jap underneath in a foxhole that we run over and it held a hand grenade up against the bottom of the tank and uh, knocked one motor out. And uh, then it wouldn't, uh, it, it, it wouldn't back up. One motor wouldn't pull it in reverse and uh, there were too many Japs down over the hill to the left and we didn't want to go ahead any further, so with a thing that wasn't working. And the lieutenant towed us back out of there. And now, was that that drawing, or did that happen at another time? That was sometime. That, anyway, that's what it was. Why don't you, could you hold that up and tell us about that drawing? <clears throat> That's got the um, 50 caliber standing up there in the middle, and they cut the track in two and three places. Uh, first, when we was um, when we went through the island, we, 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 uh, when we went through. Uh, Oh, the, the um, on the sixth, the um, six on the sixth of July. Um, We got a call 
they had a, a ditch four feet deep and six feet wide uh, clear across the island and just had a wooden bridge at each end of it. And um, when we got, um, we was at the end of the bridge, end of the ditch, and uh, on the sixth, and the lieutenant got a call that there was a man up on uh, Suicide Gulch there. That wasn't the name, but there wasn't any names on it at that time. But it was, I think, that day that the generals committed suicide in there and six, 60 soldiers shot themselves too. But um, we went up and got him out of there. And, and the lieutenant always put the um, radio man out and the loader. He just uh, took me and and the driver, so then the three of us would go in where it's, we had to get a man out. And we, so we went up around the hill, and here um, we picked this guy up, and he said, um, there's something big going on here. He said, there's really something big happened here, said, because the Japs is running back and forth down there carrying boxes. And he said, I'm shoot, I've am shoot. i been shooting them all day, and they don't even bother with me, he says. So, um, he said, I, there was a, they've got tanks down there and there's hundreds of Japs in that gully. And he said they, he saw a boogie wheel. You know what the boogie wheel is? It's a little wheel that helps oh, line, yes, yes. keep the track line. Yeah. And he said, I saw, I saw boogie wheels shining through the, camo the uh, camouflage stuff on it. And he said, I shot at it. And he said, then they shot the boulder out back of it with the 20, 37 millimeter. They turned that around, he said, and shot my boulder down until it was hardly big enough to hide back of. And uh, he was kind of shell-shocked a little. Uh, but we came back down off of that hill and I'm telling the captain of this army that's on the front line there, I says, told him just what I'd been told up there. There were hundreds of Japs down in there and they had tanks. And uh, what you'll never find any place, I, all I've read about it, they won't say what time of day that old Holland man had them move out. And it was four o'clock in the afternoon. You'll never hear this again. Uh, four o'clock in the evening, when I was talking to him, he, um, I, I told him about it and he said, oh, over there goes the colonel. He'd like to hear about this. And somebody said, get going as fast as you can go down the beach. And they took off. The, everybody took off. We went with them. And uh, at dark, they stopped. And, and they were uh, all set up waiting for Japs. Uh, and they got, came out of their foxholes. And, and, and at dark, and they didn't know there was anybody coming. But um, our lieutenant, he took us back over the ditch. Uh, and the Japs came right down the other side of the ditch where we was before when they killed, when they killed all those people. Uh, so I don't believe, and we were stuck in the ditch. I, we get up the next morning, there was a bulls flying every place. And we stayed in in the um, uh, coconut grove place there that had all mines in it at one time, and it was cleaned out. And the lieutenant took us back over the ditch. And the next morning, uh, at daylight, 
I saw all these Japs coming over the top of the hill from Paradise Valley. And they say in the, in the, in the paper there that um, they come down the valley and they come down off of the hill, a whole swarm of them. We were told at the time that there was 4,400 of them. And uh, now Holland Mad Smith says that there were 300 of them and they walked right through the 27th Division without anybody firing a shot. Well, there wasn't anybody there because he had moved everybody to the other end of the, uh, moved in 500 yards. There was, some said 500 and some said 12, but I'm guessing it's closer to 500 yards that they run as fast as they could and then it was dark and then I imagined everybody just laid down and the next morning they didn't uh, have to break through the two battalions of uh, 105 because there was nobody there. That's why there was no noise. And uh, they claimed that there was um, something that the chaps were doing in their mouth. I didn't hear a thing. And while we was there, stuck in the ditch, a Jap tank went through a little wheel, a uh, little field, and through a little woods, and I watched him go. And then the lieutenant finally towed us out of there, and we went down and went across to come up the other way, and because the road was blocked, the tanks was all sitting out there. I don't know what they put across the road to get to keep the tanks from going in, but uh, we went up the other side, and we said, I stopped to tell them that they were laying along the road, the 106th Regiment. I said, why don't you go in? All of those men are being killed in down the other 150. He says, the guy said, oh, we're tired. Well, it's 5 o'clock in the morning. What would you be tired of? And um, while I was talking to him, that Jap got loose and shut the, the uh, track in two and three places, shot the 50 caliber off of there. And um, one ch one bullet, the metal's about two and a half inches, I think, around the turret. And it went halfway through that and glanced off. And it was right at my ear. If it had come through that, I'd have had a bigger hole in my head than I got. Uh, so you were wounded at that time? No. Oh, it was later no, on. I got wounded in, in a, on Afghan, where the post, the big boulders were there. Uh, it's like a graveyard, except they were big and some, some like a big uh, refrigerator, and some as big as a car. And uh, w w then we went around that. And three Japs run into a back of a cement wall or something in there. And uh, I shot at the middle man, and a bullet hit the top of uh, the machine. They were shooting at us with machine guns or rifles. And one of them bullets hit something sharp, and a chunk of lead came off and went through that eyebrow right in the corner, and uh, I said to the, my sergeant, that there just felt like a 22 bullet or a bullet in the skin there, no blood, and just the eyebrow dropped right down on my cheek there. In a matter of a couple of seconds, and I had quite a headache, but the, I said to the sergeant, I said, hey, just felt like a bullet. And I said, sergeant, cut this out of here. And he said, no, no, no. And the, the driver said, I thought you had lead in your ass the way you went down. And uh, then we stayed there and fought till dark. 
with this land down here, and then we went to the, they run me down to the Esalito Airport there, and we stayed the night in a Japanese hangar there. Uh, and the next morning then we went on down to the hospital. And that piece of lead just stuck in and stuck out. Fifty years later, I went down to the Veterans Hospital and they x-rayed my head and they said, there's nothing wrong with the head, but there's bone chips back of your left eye floating around in there. So I talked my way out of there in two days, out of the hospital, and the doctor said, you're the only man that wants out of here. He said, we got some here that should be gone, but they don't want to go. And I was a little worried. I took off. Uh, I, I was down. To, I was walking down the street in the front of the barracks, and uh, I met a doctor coming up from taking the bath at the uh, uh, tank there. The Japs use for taking showers. And I said, uh, "When are you gonna?" He would just. Traveling to Tolerheim, I said, "What's uh, when are you going to fix me up, Doc?" And he juked down and picked up my eyebrow. And he says, "I'll get at you in about thirty days." I said, "I can't stay thirty days." I said, "Those other gunners are young fellows and and uh, freeze up on the gun. I got to get out of here." Well, the next morning they left me out, and I started walking through the sugarcane fields uh, through the ro and the road, but through a sugarcane field, and it was scary as a devil with no gun or nothing. And the Japs, we've been chasing them around through the sugarcane. We were down off of the hill among the sugarcane. That ditch. I had a picture of it in the book here. Um, I got so many things going on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> When we got out to the where we stopped there, and all the soldiers stopped, uh, and, and up on the ridge, um, I blew up a ammunition dump up there, and it was up in that area that they come down through there. Uh, but I don't believe they left. There was a man down there to fight with them. And Holland Mad Smith said there wasn't enough chaps there to leave. Uh, they had, f I believe, four battalions that couldn't, <coughs> was afraid to get or move around down there or couldn't get those chaps. They had it was a good place to hide. And they, you couldn't get in with equipment to fight with. And... Um, Hall and Mad Smith said that um, one battalion was enough. Four couldn't uh, handle them, and so he took three of them off and left four behind, and we was with them. And oh, while I was in the hospital, the. Um, <coughs> Holland Mad Smith said that um, 500 Japs had walked right through the 
27th Division there, and the Marines had to run them down and kill them before daylight, so it says. And when I got out of the hospital, they told me that the Japs had got in the column of twos and came up through the same place we figured it had come out because they had cover right up to the end of it. And quite a little bit of it was open and they went around that. But they, um, they came to a, so one soldier standing there, probably four or five feet away from him, and they gave him the password. And they were dressed in um, American uniforms and helmets. And he could see in the, just moonlight enough to see that they had the little cloth hats on in the middle and uh, that they were Japanese. And he just passed them on through. And there was 120 of them. They went to the Esalita Airport, was close there, and they ran them in and out of the airplanes, and they just blew up one airplane and damaged a couple of them. But they, there was only 120 of them instead of the, either 300 or 500, that's how Mad Smith says, uh -huh. there was in there. Now, everything was big way out of proportion if it was Marines. But the Army, they couldn't even fight one man. And if you uh, read some of these things, they really, the Army really did good. Mm -hmm. So you think that the Marines got a lot more credit than they should have? <clears throat> a lot more. Uh, that just, I don't think old Marshall was very sensible either to think that a man could be relieved because he was trying to keep down casualties. And, and they made up all kind of stories too. But we went down to, um, there was cliffs all quite a ways around the place and we got, was up on top of the cliffs there. And the Japs would run out of a hole and run around the ways and run back in them. And um, I would shoot when they got around. Uh, I'd shoot into the ground right around as close to the corner as I could, thinking the shrapnel would get them. And the one guy comes out there, and I'm all set for him. And he walked out and just kept walking. And everybody's yelling, shoot, shoot, shoot. So I finally shot and, and hit him fair with a, a three-inch gun, so he was scattered pretty well. Uh, then one day, um, oh, they, they would come out at night and dig sweet potatoes and gather, uh, they sucked on uh, oh, sugar cane. Uh, they had no, no water to speak of. And so we watched them come out in the field, and I said, I'm going <coughs> to shoot them. So I got ready to shoot, and then I saw something white. And I said, I'm, I'm not going to shoot. Nobody had told me to shoot, so I said, I'm not going to shoot because that might be women or children old people out there trying to get something to eat. And uh, so was the day. I didn't know there was any civilians there. I thought there was, there was a Japanese aisle and everybody was Japanese. And um, I only saw two, an old grandmother and two little boys. And Colonel Jensen was current three dishes to them to get them to eat and they just brought them in from the caves there. Okay, well, why don't we stop and go to another tape? How long were you on Saipan? Eight weeks.
Eight weeks. Um, well, from the 16th of um, June, from the 16th of June till the 4th of uh, August. Yeah, so, and I had, um, Lieutenant got a call one day that they were shooting Japs off of uh, the Jeeps when they went by the hill, <clears throat> and we went down, and it's 100 yards up to the cliff where they're at, and I, the sergeant said, drive up in there, and I said, Sarge, I can eat, I can shoot eight miles, why, why do I have to go after right up to them? And uh, so we stopped there, and then I got uh, a chunk of lead in my chest. And uh, he said, well, I'll, 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 I had no shirt on on my first day off in Saipan, and I just grabbed it like that, and I looked down and the froth and blood running out through my fingers. And uh, the sergeant said, we'll take you back in the tank. I said, no, I'm going to Jeep. So, I got down off of the cannon, was feeling good, and all of a sudden, down I went. Uh, so they carried me out of there and, and uh, went down to the hospital. And I think they used a dull butcher knife to, to cut, clean out around the way it felt, and uh, sewed it up with a binder twine. But I had a lot of trouble with it at first. Oh, about a year after that, the muscles had to pull to make up the difference in it. There's quite a hole in there. Mm -hmm. How long were you hospitalized for that? I don't, don't really know. Mm -hmm. But to hell up a ship for a little while to, from the 106th Infantry, was moving to um, down to um, oh, a Santos, a spirit of Santos in the um, So you were wounded two times on Saipan? Well, um, one day the lieutenant um, got a call that um, there was a Jap up in the ridge shooting people. And um, we took off. And it was quite a little ways. And while we was there, the Japs cut loose and threw two or three rounds in the crossroad, right, 50 yards or near away from us. And uh, everybody run under my cannon that could get under there. And, and I was um, warming up some, melting up some chocolate, and I took a, some pet milk along, and I was going to have me some chocolate. So I'm sitting there on the cans, stirring my chocolate, and these shells dropped in the caress road. But I could see when I first got in there that there was nobody, no Japs watching. So I said, I'll bet they have um, zeroed in on this crossroads, hoping to hit somebody coming through there. But they thought I was the bravest man around <laughs> because I just sat there and stirred my chocolate while they're all hiding. And uh, then we took off, went up the road, came to a fork in the road, and we took the left road and went about 100 yards and decided we was in the, the lieutenant decided we was in the wrong, on the wrong road. And we pulled off 
and turned around, and four jeeps came along. And three of them had been shot through the shoulder. They were set on the, so on the one spot on the back, the jeep. And on that one spot, one seat, each, each one of them got shot through the shoulder. And when we get back to the crossroad, there's a man sitting there in the road, and he shot through the shoulder at the same place. So that chap shot the four of them, and the one fell off. And he said, help, help. And the sergeant said, oh, we'll have to help him. We'll have to pick him up. I said, he can get over there back of that old truck that's sitting over there. And that's what he's waiting for us, somebody to stop here. And we would, took the other fork and went out. And there was another fork in the road, and I says, I always like to know where I was going when you're in Japanese territory. So I was, was looking through a, per, a per, periscope, mm -hmm. and I'm going to look over the top of the tank, so I didn't pull it down much, but I tried to pull it down over my ears. And... Um, looked over the top and I said, up over the hill, hill uh, pilot, and pilot said, up over the hill to Cicero, the driver, and about that time a bullet came right off the hill there. It must have just cleared my head and took the top of his head off. Oh, a hole about like that in his head. And it was just like dumping water out of a boot when he went down the bottom of that tank and down right down between his knees his head went and I grabbed a, those deep pockets and I grabbed a um, handkerchief out of there that was dirty and so dirt and then I grabbed a clean one and it was folded up and laid it over his head and, and I held it a oh, half hour to 45 minutes trying to think on that well you, you, you can't do nothing but you try to do something. So I held his head, and a Jap's got I don't know how many bullets in there, and they're going around zip, 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 like marbles in a tub. And when they hit a certain spot, I got a little chunk of lead in along my backbone. And uh, they put, I don't know, four or five pieces of lead in there. I was I was scared more about it than anything because I was sure I was bleeding to death because I couldn't see it. And uh, but he lived four hours, and the guy, the next tank, there was a tech sergeant there that had never been up to the front, and he went along for the ride, and that bastard shot him through the shoulder, and he died in just a few seconds. Uh, cut an artery off there, and Lieutenant, he got by it. So the Lieutenant figures that um, he had two guns, one shooting to this fork and one at this fork up in the hill. And the driver says, they're trying to get him on the radio, and they can't get the, uh, the guy on the radio. And I said, "Hit him! Hit him! If you ram a da the tank into the other tanks that you want and you get his attention, he that old turret turns around <laughs> to see what's going on." But um, so we got him to. We, then we went up to the top of the hill, and there was a guy laying out in the field that. Uh, they're shooting as bait, and uh, the lieutenant says, "Go back. Take the two guys back to the down to the medic." So uh, it's scary when you see what happened the first time through, and he's still waiting up there for you. Uh, so we went back, and then the lieutenant come along, and he shot at him, and he he seemed to do most of the shooting. He, he, I tell you, he, we had the one in the gully there, uh, they called, and it was um, just pretty near dark. 
and they couldn't get this fella out, and they called us, and we went in, and, and we was in, well, I, th I'm, I don't know for sure, but I think we was in Suicide Gully, and the Japs just didn't want to do anything because it was a couple of days before they did their put on the big bonsai tech. Uh, but uh, the lieutenant crawled out of his cannon and went over into the woods and was calling, and the guy finally answered him, and he threw him over his shoulder, brought him out, and put him, put him on his tank. <laughs> so you were wounded three times on Saipan? Yeah. Okay. Um, so did you go for, uh, you said you went to uh, Spirito Santos after Saipan? Yeah. Uh, New Hebrides. New Hebrides. The New Hebrides, the Spirito Santos, the big island down there. Uh, Did you have much time in the hospital with the three wounds? No. A couple of days with the eye and they put a patch over mm -hmm. it. And then I talked my way out and a, great, a guy gathering up the dead soldiers uh, picked me up and took me back to the front. And then that night it was moonlight and they said, hey Collier, that's a good target. And I took it off and threw it away and uh, never had no trouble with it. For, but it did. About a year later, it worked out and come down, went in the back of my eye, and I had to. I told him, well, take it out the same hole it came in there, so you can hardly see the scar and the thing. Uh, but I was a long time healing up with the chest. Uh, we went up through the gully. I think it was the same gully. And we stopped among the dead people there, and there was a guy, uh, oh, 40 feet away probably, and his hand would go up like that, real slow, and then he would let it fall. And after a little bit, up would go that hand again, trying to draw attention. And, and I told my sergeant, that I said, hey, there's a man over there wounded. And he said, oh, no, everybody's dead. I said, not this fellow. And uh, so he sent a guy over. And I don't know whether he died or not, but he'd been shot in the head. And then uh, we were back up through another time. And it was really looked... There was cliffs on this side, on this side there was just trees, mostly. And uh, I thought, boy, that looks dangerous at the cliff sides. So there was six, seven guys walking back of us, soldiers. And I said, better come up along the side here, because that looks pretty dangerous over there. And uh, so they came right up along the side, and I didn't any more than get stopped when one of them got shot through the heart from the other side. And they drug him up over there and put him in uh, my cannon. And uh, I checked him and I said, he's dead. And the sergeant said, we well, haven't got room for any dead. He said, we're going to take him. I said, I don't know if he's dead or not. I'm no doctor. So we took him with the pack. I didn't know with no, not much going on around there whether he how soon he'd be picked up. And... Now, were you involved in the in Okinawa also? Mm -hmm. Their artillery scared the devil out of me there. We did in Saipan, or Oak, New Hebrides, of course, is uh, March and uh, two guys went fishing with dynamite and caps and smokers. I never smoked, and um, I never picked up any cigarette butts when they 
sergeant would say, now you want to get down through here and I don't want to see a cigarette butt left laying. And I'd go in back of the tents where there, were, where there wasn't any, so. Because I hated cigarettes. And they were smokers. And I wished on the way over, there was 5,000 of us on that ship going over. And uh, I was on the fourth, in the fourth bunk. And I said, man, I wish I'd throw one of these bastards overboard so the best the rest of them would quit smoking. <laughs> How long were you in Okinawa? Probably two months. Uh, and I was out on the ship when the suicide guys came over. And in the middle of the night, you'd hear them yell, for God's sake, make smoke. <laughs> make smoke. That's the only way they could keep them off. Uh -huh. Did you see any of the ships get hit? Not while I was there. Uh, not that I know of. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, I spent two nights there and then I come home. Uh, we would fight in the daytime, and then the lieutenant did the same thing when he had to bring. They they would move the company, would move into a place, and then they leave the the M8s out until just about dark, and and bring them in, and uh, then he'd have me go out and guide him in. <laughs> and one day he took a, just me and the driver, and we went up in a big long place in Okinawa, and and we went up, and there wasn't any roads to speak of there either, but the, we were going along this flat, road uh, along the side of the hill and it was flat on the right hand side of the road and we went along and here a, a jeep or something had been blown up had a mine in the one track on the left and it was the, uh, the other side the, the track was nothing wrong and it was nice smooth going and Leach sir the driver it was pretty sliding along the other side, and he slid along the side there with that uh, M8, and then back up on the road when he got by that hole, and the, a jeep came along after we was past it 50 feet or so, and, and drove over that and flew up in the air about 15 feet. Uh, and we went on out and up, and. I don't know where he was going or what he was going for, but uh, we kept going and finally it started to rain. And I bet you they was about ready to zero in on us when, when we took off out of there and it poured and poured. And we were clear down out of there before it stopped raining. <clears throat> and we got back to our where we had to hold up. Uh, we dug a hole for three of us and the lieutenant says, make it a little wider and I'll sleep with you. So it was good to have the lieutenant because he had an extra blanket with him. But we came back with no top of the cannon. We were soaked. And there was four inches of water all over this here six by eight hole that we had there. And... So I dug a hole in one end and bailed a little water out and, and then the hole held, held what was left. And then we took um, ammunition crates, things four inches thick and three feet long or something like that. And we put a floor down in there. And then we was all ready to go to bed and I had a dry blanket, so 
I took every stitch off and was in the, and about 12 o'clock heard halt bang and here Nelson had halted somebody and the lieutenant he run out throw two hand grenades and uh, the tank driver says get up call your the tans, the Japs are here. I said, I ain't got no pants on. <laughs> <laughs> and the next morning we found a young lady there, probably 18, 19 years old, uh, Okinawa girl, and the side of her face blowed off in one leg, put her shoot up with the, where the hand grenade hit her. But they would, um, get chased out of their house in the daytime and then they'd try to find their way back at night. Mm. They was making Nelson out a hero but he wasn't feeling good at all because in the first place he had shot her. Mm. So we um, oh, did a lot of exercise in there and they sent me out early with the, um, they said they had a hold of ship up, I don't know, nobody said how long the hell up the 106th Regiment's ship there, and they were going to the New Hebrides, but here, uh, I was the only one on there, and we crossed the equator, and they, um, had some real tricks that they pulled on the guys here. Uh, and I had this big patch on my chest here, so I didn't have to go through the tube. And um, so they said, you sweep the deck. So I started sweeping the deck, and the guy said, you dumb son of a bitch, don't you even know how to use a broom? And I had to turn it upside down and sweep with the handle. <laughs> Anything was better than going through that tube there. But they, then they put me in charge of putting in the streets for the new uh, cannon company. And we had a big guy there, about six foot six, and a real nice Michigan farmer. And, uh, I weighed 140, 45 pounds, and I'd go by his tent, and he'd be laying in there on the bed, and I'd bounce in there like I weighed 300 pounds, and I'd say, well, Ginky, I'm going to drag you out of there. He said, ha, oh, ha, oh, ha. Oh. <laughs> but they went fishing with their um, dynamite, and then the guy smoking, had a cigarette in his mouth and went across it, the um, caps. One little spark fell down in there and blew it up. And uh, one of them was blind. I don't, I don't know whether the, the other one was or not. But in the hospital, I was a little full of the devil and I jumped into two guys for a wrestling match there. And they tore one shoulder off a joint went to the hospital 30 miles away and they had a, a, about ready for me to come back home and there was a guy sitting no shirt on nobody had shirts on but on the bed next to me and I reached over and gave him a right to the ribs and a left and he jumped out of the way and the shoulder jumped off it would jump off and and the ball was set up on the edge of the socket, so their arms stuck out like that. Uh, so the, Luke doc the uh, doctor says, I don't know what we're going to do with you, Carter. He says, can't keep that on. He said, uh, I guess we'll put you on limited service. I said, what's that? He said, you'll be in, probably be in a PX for the rest of the war. I said, I had a pretty good taste of war. <laughs> on Saipan, but I said, I want to fight or go home. I said, I don't want my grandchildren saying what you do. 
and I have to tell them that it was going to be excellent. All the time. <laughs> so I didn't have to go in the first place, and then the shoulder was going to get me out. We did uh, maneuvers on uh, um, New, New Hebrides. Uh, I was a walker, still, still am when I can, but uh, my walking days are about over. Now, after you uh, left Okinawa, where did you go? Shea Gap. I come back to Fort Dix. Uh, on Okinawa, the, we'd be doing things during the day, but at night uh, the, uh, there was only a few soldiers left. And um, Sugarloaf Hill, um, we'd go up there every night and uh, set in the foxholes. And scared the devil out of me. They have big shells that came across there. Uh, we went one time in the daytime, <clears throat> and we came to a, a, an overhang, a cliff that was overhang almost from here to the corner. And it started out at about uh, two feet high and got to about seven or eight feet high, and. Uh, About 15 or 20 of us went in there at night, and uh, they had the big shell, that 15-inch deal, and they'd shoot it, and you didn't seem to hear it until it got by the end of the, the uh, where the stone wall was, mm -hmm. and once it got by there, it sounded like a freight train going by, and you followed it with your eyes just like you could see it. <laughs> Just about all, or a lot of them, you'd sit, mm -hmm. sit there and watch them with your eyes. And I was watching, and there was a little stick stuck down from the roof, and just a little thing. And it, when I turned my head, it would run. I was just sure that it was a Jap. Uh, and then I figured out that it, it was that stick sticking down there. And, and on um, when the lieutenant on Saipan, when he was in the, with the, getting the guy out in the night there when it was dark, every time I looked, there was a stump there that had uh, little shoots on the side. It, Six or a foot, about a foot long, and it just looked like the brush they put in their helmets. Uh -huh. And when the lieutenant come back, I said, "Lieutenant, there's a Jap over there," and he said, "Well, shoot us." <laughs> uh, trying to think where else we saved somebody. I often wondered why, if he didn't care whether I got killed or what it was, but I about figured out, I, I was a, never was a young guy. I think I was born an old man, and um, a lot of common sense, and I think that um, that that's what he was going on, that um, I'd be the best one to have with him in a pinch. But one time we came out of the woods and there were seven guys there and the lieutenant said, um, where's your outfit? He said, this is it. Seven guys left. Now 
Now, after you, you said you returned to Pennsylvania um, after you were discharged. Did you ever use the GI Bill? No. How about the 5220 Club? I, I, uh, I belong to it. Did you join any veterans organizations? Oh, the American Legion. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing. How do you think your time in service changed or had an effect on your life? Oh, I think I came out pretty much what I went in. It didn't hurt me, mm -hmm. and I'm glad I went. And the veterans has really been good to me. Mm -hmm. Now you had sent us this photograph. If you just hold it like this, could you tell us where and when that was taken? That'd be um, Honolulu in what forty, probably forty-two. Okay. Yeah, uh, just about forty-two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, did you want to take a shot at these? Oh yes. Um, what I'm going to what I'm going to do. Or if, if you'd like to stand over by that, uh, okay, okay, you can go ahead and explain the, the medals there in the frame. <laughs> okay, go ahead. My wife sent my discharge papers to Washington, and that's what they sent me back. That's how much I know about it. I know that's uh, for shooting. Well, that's the combat inf infantry badge. Yeah, and yep. that's uh, the Purple Heart. Yep, with the three clusters, three clusters. on it. Clusters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah. your dog tags over there, I see. Yep. Over overseas yeah. stripes. I was yeah. overseas 39 months and 10 days. Never saw anybody I knew for 46 months. Mm -hmm. I probably would have got homesick, but I so tickled that uh, fighting was there instead of at home. <laughs> now, did you want to hold up that uh, medal you got from Saipan? And you received this too. Why don't you read that into it? Read this? Yeah. Okay, the certificate says, On the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the Battles of Saipan and Tinian, this certificate is presented to... <laughs> Thurl B. Amos Collier. Okay, in honor of your heroism and dedication during the Second World War, your service to the people of the Pacific Islands, and in honor of the memories of those who made the ultimate sacrifice for the cause of freedom. We appreciate your valor, courage, and sacrifice to the islands upon which history was written, given this 30th day of June 2005. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you.